This morning I would like to move away from our study of the Gospel of Mark and try to make some biblical sense out of this mass shooting that has occurred. And I'm going to be looking at several passages of Scripture, but if you want to find a place to kind of land, it will be in Romans chapter 3, where we will look closely at verses 10 through 18. Well, once again, our hearts are aching over the brutal murders of the school children and teachers in Texas. And as we did just a few minutes ago, we just continue to pray that God would bring comfort and clarity and even conviction to those who have lost loved ones, knowing that ultimately the only way that can happen is through the power of the gospel. Apart from the gospel, there are no answers, there is no hope, and there is no comfort. It's all hollow. Now, I'm not going to talk about the shooter in particular or whether or not he was somehow some pawn of some government scheme. I don't have the facts on all of that. And frankly, we will never get the facts on that. We seldom do. However, we do know that the Democrats will certainly use this to promote gun control, as they are already doing, and distract the public from the disastrous policies that are destroying our country. And anybody that has an open mind and is unbiased will admit that these policies are a deliberate destruction of our country so as to transform it into a collective Marxist welfare state that they can control, which, by the way, cannot coexist with an armed citizenry or with biblical Christianity. Both must go. Instead, I want this morning to give you a biblical perspective of mass shootings and violence in general because our politicians and our so-called experts have no answers. Their answers are as futile as they are foolish. Of course, one answer is gun control. Let's take away any means for people to have uh, an automatic weapon, which ultimately deprives others from protecting themselves. The other answer is do something more with mental illness because that's what's causing this with these people. We need more resources to spot these murderers and, and get them the treatment that they need. And I think anyone that is honest about all of this will have to say, you know, that's just aspirin for cancer. There's something far deeper going on than access to automatic weapons and mental illness. Let me give you some facts. This is the 27th school shooting this year. Since 2018, there have been 119 such incidents. A little bit of stats on mass shootings. Mass shootings, according to the studies that I looked at, includes a shooting where four or more people were killed. 424 mass shootings in 2019 it jumped up to 512 in 2020, now 636 in 2021. And of course, it's moving along here in 2022. According to the statistics, 74% of the shooters are black, 12% are Latin, 12% white, 2% Asian. 47% are between the ages of 18 and 25, and 25% between the age of 26 and 35. And certainly anyone with any common sense can see some correlation with the fact that 70%, over 70% of black children are born out of wedlock. And 67% of black children are born into a single parent household. And we've got a gun problem. We've got a mental illness problem. 
Frankly, what happened in Texas is commonplace in Chicago. According to the Chicago Police Department, in 2021 ended with 797 homicides. There were 3,561 shooting incidents in 2021, which is just over 300 more than were recorded in 2020, and a staggering 1,415 more shooting incidents than were recorded in the city in 2019. So you can see this massive increase. Despite, by the way, the fact that they have some of the strictest gun control laws in the country. So are all these people mentally ill? Is that what the issue is? And we've got to somehow make sure that they don't have access to guns, assuming that that is even possible. And then all of these problems will go away. Dear friend, let me give you some statistics that are exceedingly more heinous than what I have just read. 2,363 babies are killed by abortion every day in America. According to one study, quote, an average of 2,363 63 babies are killed daily by legal abortion in the United States, with nearly 300 of them aborted in the second or third trimester of pregnancy. Violently suctioned from their mother's wombs, starved of nutrients with pills, dismembered or poisoned by lethal injection. The total abortion since 1973, when Roe v. Wade was introduced and passed, is about 64 million. Folks, we live in a society where half of the people have zero regard for human life. And they wonder why an 18-year-old male would go into a school like that and commit such atrocities. And they wonder why just a few weeks back another 18-year-old white man would murder 10 innocent black people in a grocery store in Buffalo, New York. The problem again, they say, well, it's access to those automatic rifles. If we somehow take that away, that'll take care of it. And also, you know, they're hearing these racist conspiracy theories, radicalization, isolation, mental illness, which by the way, I looked up. It is, quote, a disorder that can cause psychological and behavioral disturbances with varying severities. The symptoms include confusion, depression, social withdrawal, extreme feelings of pleasure, anger, excitement, fear, or grief. That's a perfect description of the toddlers that we have raised. Causes can include long-term substance abuse, prenatal damage to the brain, injury to brain, exposure to tox toxins, infection, etc. And the treatments include combinations of medication, psychotherapy, peer support, and sometimes hospitalization in severe cases. So is that what the real issue is here? Dear friends, the real issue is sin in the human heart and Satan ruling this world. And the only remedy is the gospel and that's what the world simply refuses to acknowledge. These people need a heart transplant, heart transplant spiritually speaking. They don't need psychotherapy, they don't need peer support or a gun-free environment, assuming again that's even possible. They need saving faith in the living Christ where they can find forgiveness of sins and a transformed heart. That's the power of the gospel. By the way, that's why you never hear, oh my, here we go again, another 18-year-old male born-again Christian who loves Christ and his word just went out and shot up a bunch of people. You never hear that, do you? No. Of course, our culture doesn't want to hear any of this. 
In fact, what I am preaching right now is considered to be racist, bigoted, and indicative of a white supremacist. Those Christians are right-wing hate mongers deceived by the myths and the conspiracy theories of the Bible. Well, my friends, this is to be expected because these people, and maybe some of you that are listening right now, have no fear of God. We know biblically, for example, in Proverbs chapter 1 and verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But he goes on to say, fools despise wisdom and instruction. And this is where we must begin if we're going to make sense out of these mass shootings and other forms of violence. And certainly what I am telling you today, you're not going to hear in the media. Or if you do, it will be because somebody posted another right-wing, knuckle-dragging, Neanderthal Christian who is pushing the Bible on people. That's regrettable, but that's understandable because they have no fear of the Lord, which is the beginning of knowledge. That's the foundation. In the Old Testament, to fear God includes not only the terrifying dread of his judgment upon sin, but we also see that the fear of the Lord can be used to express faith and obedience as, for example, it did with Abraham who trusted in God. We read about this in Genesis 22. You will recall he was about uh, to obey God and sacrifice his son and the angel of the Lord said to him, I know that you fear God. However, here in Proverbs 1.7 and throughout the book of Proverbs, the fear of the Lord refers to worship. It speaks of a reverential awe and belief in the Lord God who has revealed himself in creation and in his word. But dear friends, you will never be able to fear a God you do not know. And you cannot know the one true God apart from his self-revelation in his word. Therefore, to fear the Lord is directly proportional to understanding who he is as he has revealed himself, not only in creation, in general revelation, but in special revelation, in his word, in the Bible, and in the person and the work of the Lord Jesus Christ. The fear of the Lord speaks of the fear of Yahweh. The Lord is Yahweh. It is the Old Testament name of God. This is where you must begin. If you're going to make sense out of all of these things, you have to begin by understanding who Yahweh is. Here we can go back to Exodus chapter 3, beginning in verse 13. There we read, Then Moses said to God, Behold, I am going to the sons of Israel, and I will say to them, The God of your fathers has sent me to you. Now, they may say to me, What is his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And he said, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, I am has sent me to you. God furthermore said to Moses, thus you shall say to the sons of Israel, the Lord, that is Yahweh, the God of your fathers, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob has sent me to you. This is my name forever, and this is my memorial name to all generations. If you want to understand what's going on in our world and in our country, you must fear Yahweh. You've got to know who he is. Yahweh appears more than 6,800 times in the Old Testament. It's derived from the, what we call the tetragrammaton, the four letters, uh, the four Hebrew consonants uh, translated in English, Y-H-W-H, Yahweh. And it comes from the Hebrew verb for being, kava. So the name indicates that God, Ill, God is, 
and wills to be. It implies that God is the one who has no beginning and will have no ending. It implies that he is the ever-present God. He, his being is derived from his own self-determination. And he is what he is. He is eternally who he is. I mean, these things blow the mind when you begin to understand what God is saying. And God revealed his name as, quote, his name, and quote, my name forever at the burning bush in Exodus 3. And there God responded to Moses' question about his name, again, saying, I am who I am. I am, that's my name, I am, which speaks of his eternal and unchanging nature. And in the New Testament, Jesus repeatedly claimed the Old Testament name of God. He identified himself as the great I am. Again, the Old Testament name of Yahweh. And this means Jesus is the great I am. Jesus is the pre-existent, self-existent, uncreated creator, sustainer, redeemer, and consummator of all things. So dear friends, if you want to understand mass shootings, mass shooters, violence, wickedness, this is where you must begin. Ah, but I don't believe that stuff. And sadly, I'm sure that's true. And that is indicative of someone who has no fear of the Lord. And that's why those that want nothing to do with this will continue to live a life of meaninglessness uselessness and fear but if you will humble yourself and learn who he is and be reconciled to him through the provision of his son the Lord Jesus Christ you will be radically saved you will be radically changed and you will understand these things because God will give you discernment spiritual discernment and this is why our culture is clueless about how to stop the escalating violence that we see. I was thinking about this. It's amazing to think about this. Let me put it this way. I mean, you're surprised at this barbaric act when we live in a country that mocks the one true God, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the Lord God, the triune God. You're surprised at this when we teach our children the theory of evolution, that we are nothing more than sophisticated worms that have somehow evolved. So there's no moral authority, there's no moral absolutes, there's no moral standard of righteousness, no accountability to a creator God, no judgment. You just live and then you die. There's no higher purpose than just satisfying your own lusts. We teach our young people this, and then you wonder why they do the things they do. We live in a culture that criminalizes righteousness and legalizes unrighteousness, especially by attacking marriage, which is one of the institutions that God has ordained and promised to bless, marriage between one man and one woman for life. We live in a culture that has removed every vestige of Christianity from the public square and mock Bible-believing Christians. A culture that celebrates the LGBTQIA plus lifestyle when God calls it an abomination. We live in a culture that tells little boys that they can be little girls if they want to, or little girls can become little boys a culture that supports blocking hormones and chemical and surgical castration. Inconceivable. We've got lawmakers and corporations that support these hormone blockers for children. Children who want to choose what gender they want to be. We've got millions of people who support these types of things. We've got millions of people that support the brutal dismemberment of unborn babies 
and they wonder why people have no respect for human life. We live in a culture that uses the fabricated and demonstrably false social construct of systemic racism to divide and to conquer us, to tell white people that they're racist just because of the color of their skin. We allow groups like Black Lives Matter and Antifa criminals to loot and burn and even kill without consequence. In fact, they are rewarded. We live in a culture that has taken away all of the tools of common sense discipline within the home and within the schools and even within law enforcement. And yet they will give credibility to the MSNBC watching left-wing lunatics that call for defunding the police. You remove all of the essential tools to enforce the law, even in our courts. And then you allow angry, selfish, undisciplined punks who have no respect for authority to kill hundreds of thousands of people almost every day with their video games. We've got courts that give more rights to criminals than to victims. Violent criminals get arrested and before the day is over they are released and they brag about it. No consequences. Criminals being rewarded for wickedness and you wonder why we have mass shootings? We allow hundreds of thousands of people to enter our country illegally with no consequences. We allow greedy, corrupt, narcissistic politicians that are as crooked as a barrel of snakes to do unbelievable things and get away with it with no consequences. We allow even our FBI and healthcare experts to lie without consequence. People in highest, the highest levels of government to do all kinds of illegal activities that threaten our democracy and our health and they suffer no consequences. We live in a country where Hollywood and the entertainment industry spends billions annually to somehow pervert the minds and the hearts of our children. We allow the music industry to pump pornographic, misogynistic, violent lyrics into the minds of our young people. We allow public schools to indoctrinate our children to become woke Marxists. We celebrate the wokeification, if you will, of our young people the feminization of our males and the masculinization of our females. And then we teach our children to be offended over the slightest little thing that hurts their feelings. So they're always looking for the next microaggression and then they can scream foul and draw attention to themselves. We have elitists in the news media pumping endless virtue signaling and manufactured outrage. We allow government and political operatives to commit widespread voter fraud to change the outcome of elections and there's no consequences, none. We've got transgender, quote unquote, children and, go and government officials that identify as dogs and cats and wear animal costumes, we call furries. Some of it's happening right here in our community, in our schools. We allow the minds of our kids to be utterly transfixed with these little computer screens where they witness thousands of the most gross forms of immorality and violence. And we have sodomites and lesbian ministers and drag queens giving presentations to our children in churches. And you think we have a gun control problem? You think we have a mental illness problem? My friend, we have a depravity problem. And in our country, we have sown the wind 
and we are reaping the whirlwind. And God calls anyone who thinks otherwise a fool. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. But for those who want to understand God's perspective and find hope and clarity in the gospel of Christ, all you have to do, as we're trying to do here this morning, is to look into his self-revelation of himself in his word. And what you'll find is God is infinitely holy and man is totally depraved. All that man is and all that man does is fundamentally offensive to a holy God. What you will find is that sin entered into the world through one man, into Adam, through Adam, and through Adam, because of Adam, all men have sinned. We are all guilty before a holy God. All men are sinners by nature, and all men are capable of the most heinous of sins. God cursed man and all of creation because of sin, and he allowed Satan to temporarily rule this world, along with his demons, a hierarchy of vile creatures that orchestrate all of the systems in the world and in our culture. Satan is called the adversary, father of lies, a murderer, prince of the power of the air, ruler of the darkness, ruler of this world, ruler of the demons, the spirit who works in the sons of disobedience, the tempter, the god of this age, the wicked one, and on it goes. And his world system is designed to thwart the purposes of God, to destroy all of the institutions that God has erected, and there are two primary ones, marriage and the church, both of which is to be headed by Christ. But yet God in his infinite love and mercy has provided a remedy in the gospel. And herein is the great news. So if you're gonna make sense out of mass shootings, we need to look at this and we need to have a biblical anthropology, a biblical understanding of human beings made in the image of God, yet cursed because of sin and in desperate need of reconciliation. And that brings us to our text here in Romans 3. This is God's perspective of humanity, beginning in verse 10. There is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands, there is none who seeks for God. All have turned aside, together they have become useless. There is none who does good, there is not even one. Their throat is an open grave, with their tongues they keep deceiving. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their paths, and the path of peace they have not known. There is no fear of God before their eyes. Now, in this text, God has been making a universal charge that all men are under sin. And here in verses 10 through 18, he gives us the undeniable evidence of that fact. He begins in verse 10, he says, as it is written. In other words, the Apostle Paul here, inspired by the Spirit of God, is building his case not upon conjecture or human reasoning, but upon the absolute authority of divine revelation. It has been written, referring to the Old Testament scriptures. And here the Apostle goes to the Old Testament to produce a 14-point indictment divided into three separate categories, each exposing a unique domain of man's sin. Those categories are, number one, our nature, number two, our speech, and number three, our behavior. You want to understand a mass shooter? Do You want to understand a depraved culture and depraved political leaders? Here it is. And I might also add that this also describes every single one of us as born again believers prior to God in his mercy saving us and changing us. So the undeniable evidence that all men are under sin is first seen in our nature. Notice verse 10, there is none righteous, not even one. Verse 11, there is none who understands, there is not even 
There is none who seeks for God. Verse 12, all have turned aside together. They have become useless. There is none who does good. There is not even one. My, what an abysmal reality. Let's look at this closely. He says, none are righteous. Now, although all men, even the most wicked men, can do good things occasionally, none are righteous. The term means in the original, none are perfectly obedient to the commands of God. None are innocent, none are faultless, none are guiltless, none are perfectly acceptable to God. There's only one man that's ever been that way and that was Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, where is the man that is perfectly in line with God's standards? None of us. Yet Jesus said, you are to be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect in Matthew 5, 48. Worse yet, he goes on to say, there is none who understands. The term understands means to be, to be put together or, or to comprehend. They do not have the knowledge of those things which pertain to salvation. Because of his nature, man is spiritually retarded. He cannot grasp the depths of his sin. He cannot grasp the message of the gospel. Oh, he can see it intellectually, but he cannot grasp it in such a way as to savingly believe. You explain to people that you are a sinner by nature, that you have offended a holy God and you need the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ, and they will look at you and laugh. That is foolishness. And of course, we're told that that's the response. 1 Corinthians 2.14 says that a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God for they are foolishness to him and he cannot understand them. Why? Because they are spiritually appraised. Appraised is anachronitai in the original language, a ju judicial term. It means they are incapable of rendering a decision because they cannot recognize the facts in a court of law. That's the idea. They cannot see it. They cannot discern. They cannot examine properly. They cannot understand. Ephesians chapter 4, verse 17, Paul describes the unsaved this way. Those who walk in the futility of their mind. In other words, their ability to rationally, intellectually process spiritual and moral issues is futile. It's vain. It's useless. To put it very practically, two plus two is always going to equal five, no matter how you put it. He goes on to say, being darkened in their understanding, excluded from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them, because of the hardness of their heart. Dear friends, we, apart from Christ, are nothing more than spiritual cadavers, dead in our trespasses and sins. And then we're doubly blinded because of Satan. Verse 10, he goes on again, there is none righteous, not even one. There is none who understands. So naturally, in verse 11, he goes on to say, there is none who seeks for God. He's actually quoting Psalm 42, 14, 2 at that point. So how does anybody ever come to faith in Christ? Well, Romans 10, verse 17 tells us that faith comes from hearing and hearing by the word of Christ. Well, let me digress for a moment because some will say, well, what about those who live in foreign lands who have never heard the gospel? Well, dear friends, because God, not man, is sovereign over salvation. All those who were ordained to eternal life will hear the gospel and they will believe the gospel and they will be saved. Romans 8, verse 29, for those whom he foreknew, meaning he foreloved, referring to the doctrine of election, he also predestined to become conformed to the image of his son so that he would be the firstborn among many brethren. And these whom he predestined, he also called. And these whom he called, he also justified. And these whom he justified, he also glorified. But may I remind you, like all men everywhere, According to Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 that we read earlier, the unregenerate, those who have never been born again, those apart from Christ, those who have no fear of the Lord, he says, suppress the truth in unrighteousness. 
because that which is known about God is evident within them, for God made it evident to them, and indeed he has, because we're all made in his image. He goes on to say, for since the creation of the world, his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood through what has been made, so that they are without excuse. For even though they knew God, they did not honor him as God or give thanks, but they became futile in their speculations and their foolish heart was darkened. So my friends, all men are without excuse because of reason and because of conscience. In fact, every man's conscience bears witness to God's righteous standard. We read about this in chapter two and verse 14. He says, for when Gentiles who do not have the law do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law are a law to themselves and in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts. Their conscience bearing witness and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. And that's why we as believers can in many ways get along with non-believers because we all have some sense of right and wrong because we're all made in the image of God. And he has written that law on our hearts. Dear friends, man is not in need of more evidence. He is in need of God's gift of saving faith imparted by the Holy Spirit through his word. And we can rejoice knowing, as Jesus said in John 6, 37, all that the Father gives me shall come to me. In other words, the initiative comes from the Father. And then the Father will draw them unto himself. And Jesus said in John 6, 44, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. So God will draw those who would never seek him on their own. And I'm so thankful that he does that and that he did that in my life. Because had he not sought me, I would have never sought him. Paul continues in his evidence that men are under sin by nature. Verse 12, all have turned aside. It's the idea of they have deviated from the right way and are pursuing the wrong way. Proverbs 8 verse 13 says that there is a way that seems right to a man, but whose end is the way of death. And indeed, man will always choose the wide gate and travel down the broad way that leads to destruction, not the narrow way that leads to eternal life. He goes on to say, together they have become useless. The Greek word here for useless is rather interesting. It translates a human or a Hebrew word um, that speaks of milk that has turned sour. That is, what, that is what man has become, useless, something that is unprofitable, that needs to be discarded. We're kind of like, if I can shift metaphors here, we're, we're, we're like a dead tree that doesn't produce any fruit apart from Christ. We are of no use to God. He goes on to say, there is none who does good. The term good here speaks of, of the course of a man's life, that needs to be characterized by moral integrity consistent with the perfect standard of God's goodness. He says, there is not even one. So the inspired apostle provides evidence substantiating the charge that all men are under sin, beginning with God's testimony against man's very nature. And then his charge now is further corroborated by the evidence seen in, secondly, our speech, beginning in verse 13. He says, their throat is an open grave. Boy, that's halitosis on steroids, right? I mean, there's no mouthwash that will cover that up because this is a stench that comes from the heart. Jesus made this clear in Matthew 15, verse 18. The things that proceed out of the mouth come from the heart. You will remember in Isaiah 6, when when Isaiah was in the presence of the glory of God, he says, woe is me, I am undone. Literally, I am disintegrating because I am a man of what? Unclean lips which gives evidence to the uncleanliness of his heart. 
The stench of a rotting corpse in an open grave is perhaps the most vile of all odors. And the imagery here is that even as an open grave reveals the rancid contents within, so too the throat reveals the rottenness of the human heart, a heart that is so wretched, it is so vile, so filled with loathsome thoughts that it can be likened to a decomposing corpse. That's how God sees the unregenerate. The speech of the wicked makes you gag, doesn't it, when you're around it and you hear this stuff? The cursing, the slander, the gossip, just the foolishness. Even the, even the flattery, the deceit, the immorality. I mean, fools deny God. They blaspheme God. They mock sin. Proverbs 10, verse 14, the mouth of the foolish is near destruction. Verse 32, the mouth of the wicked is perverted. Chapter 18, verse 7, a fool's mouth is his destruction, and his lips are the snare of his soul. The apostle goes on in verse 13, with their tongues they keep deceiving deceiving, doleo, it carries the idea of, 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 a, of a decoy or, or luring prey with a baited trap or uh, a baited hook. And it, it's also in the imperfect tense grammatically. So this speaks of the idea of, of continual habitual action. In other words, what he's saying is the natural man apart from Christ is a habitual liar. He is a habitual fraud. He will deceive you in an effort to act in his own best interest. That's just his nature. And I must say, dear friends, that prior to coming to Christ, we're all con artists. We're all politicians. We're all prosperity preachers. We're all deceivers by nature. We lie to others because we lie to ourselves. Verse 13, he goes on to say, the poison of asps is under their lips. Poisonous snakes are interesting. We've got them around here. Several of us have been bitten by them before. Fortunately, it never went through my boot. But poisonous snakes have a sack of poison under their lips so that when their fangs are extended um, outward in aggression, they press against that sack and causes that sack to squirt deadly venom through the hollow fangs into the victim. But dear friends, the most deadly bite of all, the one that is the most painful, will be the bite of another human being. Those people that speak against us in order to cause us harm, those people that slander, those people that tell lies, that deceive others, especially those in false religions, Verse 14, he goes on to say, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Cursing speaks of malediction. It speaks of slander. It speaks of just extreme defamation with the intent to utterly destroy another person. And the term bitterness here carries the idea of just extreme hatred and wicked intentions. Boy, don't we experience this all the time these days? And notice, it's not so much what a man does as what he is. Though he may seldom speak, his mouth is full of curses and bitterness. And given the right context, this is going to spew forth. In Psalm 64, too, David was well acquainted with this kind of a person, and he asked the Lord to hide him from, quote, those who do iniquity, who have sharpened their tongue like a sword, he goes on to say, aimed bitter speech as their arrow to shoot from concealment at the blameless. Suddenly they shoot at him and do not fear. They hold fast to themselves an evil purpose. They talk of laying snares secretly. I mean, who among us have not been the victim of this kind of attack? And who among us have not been the attacker? That man is under sin is corroborated now by our nature and by our speech and finally by our, by our behavior. Notice verse 15. Their feet are swift to shed blood. 
Beloved, this speaks of man's predisposition to murder. You know, it's interesting, unlike any other species, a human child can get so violently angry that if it were possible, that child would kill its parent. And some eventually do. And human history is filled with savage human torture and violence, from wars to domestic violence. Again, I think of just abortion. 1.6 million every year, four every minute, one every 15 seconds. Man is swift to do violence and slow to do peace. Verse 16, destruction and misery are in their paths. Destruction, it's a term that means that that which is broken, that which is shattered, a, a fracture, a calamity causing complete ruin and destruction. And the term misery speaks of hardship and trouble and and wretchedness and calamity. And think of the utter destruction and misery of most of the people who live around the world due to satanic religions like Islam that treats women worse than animals. The utter destruction and misery brought on by sexual abuse and human trafficking and spousal abuse and just recently this week the executive committee of the Southern Baptist Convention we read maintained a secret list of more than 700 pastors and other church affiliated personnel accused of sexual abuse. The list was released this week quote in response to a historic report from investigative, from an investigative firm, Guidepost Solutions, into SBC leaders, a failure to address sexual abuse for more than two decades. And it's not just the Southern Baptist Convention. I mean, this is, this is commonplace in many denominations. Again, destruction and misery are in their paths. You see, people without Christ, and by the way, these 700 pastors are without Christ. You have no basis to claim genuine saving faith to be a new creature in Christ and habitually live that way. So these are predators in pulpits. But these people leave a trail of destruction. Just think of those who were abused. I've worked with so many of them over the years. Shattered marriages and broken homes people that are devastated by drugs and alcohol. Millions of women are raped around the world, abandoned by their husbands, left to raise their children and they're on their own. Hundreds of millions of people are killed in wars. I believe 66 million were killed in World War II. I remember when I was in Russia, I believe they said they lost 20 million people in World War II. Verse 17, and the path of peace have they not known. Indeed, there is no peace, dear friends, until the Prince of Peace returns. An unknown author wrote one of the most compelling and powerful descriptions of sin. It was written in 1877. Let me read this to you. Quote, it is a debt, a burden, a thief, a sickness, a leprosy, a plague, poison, a serpent, a sting. Everything that man hates, it is a load of curses and calamities beneath whose crushing, most intolerable pressure the whole creation groaneth. Who is the hoary sexton that digs man a grave? Who is the painted temptress that steals his virtue? Who is the murderess that destroys his life? Who is the sorceress that first deceives and then damns his soul? Sin. Who with icy breath blights the fair blossoms of youth? Who breaks the hearts of parents? Who brings old men's gray hairs with sorrow to the grave? Sin. Who by a more hideous metamorphosis than Ovid even fancied, changes gentle children into vipers, tender mothers into monsters, and their fathers into worse than Herods, the murderers of their own innocence? Sin. Who casts the apple of discord on household hearts? 
who lights the torch of war and bears it blazing over trembling lands, who by divisions in the church rends Christ's seamless robe, sin, who is this Delilah that sings the Nazarite asleep and delivers up the strength of God into the hands of the uncircumcised, who with winning smiles on her face, honey, flattery on her tongue, stands in the door to offer the sacred rites of hospitality, and when suspicion sleeps, treacherously pierces our temples with a nail. What fair siren is this who, seated on a rock by the deadly pool, smiles to deceive, sings to lure, kisses to betray, and flings her arm around our neck to leap with us into perdition? Sin who turns the soft and gentlest heart to stone, who hurls reason from her lofty throne and impels sinners mad as gathering swine down the precipice into a lake of fire. Sin. And why all of this? We see it again here in our text in verse 18. There is no fear of God before their eyes. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and instruction. The unregenerate man fears all kinds of things in his life. He fears embarrassment, he fears poverty, he fears disease, he fears death, but he has no fear of God. And without that, we know that God will eventually judge him or her. So the evidence is in, and we see here in verse 19 as we wrap this up this morning, now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law that every mouth may be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. Indeed, every human being is under the authority of their creator. Every man is accountable to God and God has rendered his verdict. The verdict is in and, and it is guilty as charged. Notice it's uncontested here. The accused stands in silence. Why? Because verse 20 the works of the law, by the works of the law, no flesh will be justified in his sight. For through the law comes the knowledge of sin. In other words, man cannot meet the demands of the law. The supreme law is to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. Who among us have ever done that? And then secondly, to love our neighbor as much as we love ourselves. His nature will not allow him his speech and his behavior, both in secret and in public, are an abomination to God. Therefore, man is utterly doomed, he is condemned, and he is in desperate need of a righteousness he cannot conjure up on his own. And dear friends, there's where I can offer you the hope of the gospel. The good news that Christ has come and lived the perfect life that we could not live, and he went to the cross and he bore our sins in his body and paid that penalty forever that those who would place their faith in his saving grace and in him alone would not only be saved and have their sins forgiven but also enjoy the imputed righteousness of Christ and the radical transformation of his nature. And when you understand these things, then you understand that you cannot make sense out of mass shootings until you understand human depravity and until you understand Satan's rule in this world and until you understand the fear of the Lord and his great provision in the gospel of Christ. So I leave you with that and I pray that by the power of his grace you all will believe and be saved and for those of us who know and love Christ, that we will live to the praise of his glory until he comes and takes us unto himself. Even so, Lord Jesus, come quickly. Let's pray together. Father, thank you for the eternal truths of your word, and I pray that by them we will all be changed. Certainly, most of us, within the sound of my voice, have been born again by your grace. and We celebrate your love for us, but our hearts break for those who do not know you. 
And we pray that you will move upon the unregenerate in such a way as to cause them to be overwhelmed by the reality of their, of their sin, that they will come running to the foot of the cross and cry out to you for your saving grace that you will give so rich and so free. So we commit all of this to you in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. We pray you've been edified by this presentation. You've been listening to the teaching ministry of Calvary Bible Church in Jolton, Tennessee. For more information on Calvary Bible Church or for more audio, please visit our website at cbctn.org.